Thank you all so much for coming to a uh, really, I'm really excited about this panel for, uh, of the history of games for girls. Um, we're gonna kind of split things up in half and then have some time to, to come back and discuss. Now we were actually both graduate students at the University of Texas at the same time yes. doing video game research on the history of girls games and we like never crossed. We never crossed paths. <laughs> like, <ever. laughs> um, but now you're at the University of... I'm at uh, Illinois Institute of Technology yes, that's in right. Chicago. Yeah. And I'm kind of just doing my own thing as an independent artist and um, pro-am archivist. Yeah. So you ready to get started? Yeah, let's do this thing. All right. So um, I kind of wanted to seed this conversation with a couple of discussion questions. These are things that like we both come across in our work uh, studying and um, like uncovering the history of video games for girls. Um, and these are questions that you might have, these are questions that we get all the time, and things that we'll probably talk about in the course of our discussion and come back to later. So first of all, what are girl games? Um, I don't think any of us has like a, a, a very easy answer to that, but it's, uh, it's a really interesting question. Um, why weren't there any girl games back in the day is a question I get a lot. Um, doesn't the concept of girl games reinforce the gender binary? Um, that's a really interesting question. And um, this last one is not really a question, it's more like a comment. I'm a girl and I hate pink stuff. Um, and that's a totally valid feeling. And um, I think that that question or that comment actually underpins a lot of the stuff that's really interesting about studying games and software for girls. So um, just some things to think about as we discuss a couple of areas of interest for us. Yeah. So. Um I'm gonna pull this closer to me so I do not have to lean over. All right, so I'm working right now on a project about the history of the Games for Girls movement, and I'm especially interested in kind of like the crest and falling apart. Um, so when there was a purple market. Um, and so if you're wondering who I am, my name is Carly Kasurik. Like I said, I'm at the Illinois Institute of Technology. I've written a couple books. Uh, the first one's Coiner Operated Americans about the history of video game arcades in the US. Um, and the second is Brenda Laurel about the design, his, or design career of game designer Brenda Laurel, who's super, super interesting. And then at the bottom I have a thing um, partially because I want to brag. I'm kidding, I don't actually want to brag. Um, but just to let you know what I'm working on currently and kind of the scale of it, um, I'm working on a, a project on Games for Girls and particularly documenting it. And I was able to get funding from the National Science Foundation for that, which is great because doing the kind of oral history I do is actually quite costly in terms of resources. And so I wouldn't be able to do it at this scale or at this speed without that kind of external funding. Um, so really short introduction of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give uh, some historical context of where this comes out of. I'm going to talk about what Henry Jenkins and Justine Cassells called the unstable coalition of games for girls. Um, talk about reasons that it ends up falling apart and then kind of give some lessons for the present because I think we can actually uh, learn from this and part of why I'm so interested in this is we're, we're pumping millions of dollars into like diversity in STEM and I think sometimes we're doing a really bad job because we like never stop and think about what didn't work. Um, so from like the 1970s to the 1980s you get major changes in how games are marketed. So the the ad on the left is for Space Invaders on Atari and it it's kind of like a jokey ad but it's the whole family is lined up to play because everyone in the family wants to play. Um, and that's actually pretty in line with how Atari advertised for many years. They advertised as something your whole family would use, partially because the, they're expensive, right? And you're not gonna buy like a really fancy toy for one person. These were seen as kind of family appliances almost. Uh, by 1982 though, that changes and we get things like this. And this is one of my favorite photographs. It's um, it's from Life Magazine, it's the 1982 Year in Pictures issue, and this is the best gamers in the world as photographed in Ottumwa, Iowa by a very serious photographer. Um, I, I'm, I'm not joking, he's a very serious uh, photographer, his name's Enrico Fiorelli, um, and the cheerleaders are like the real cheerleaders from the local high school, right? So like massive change in how we're thinking about it. Uh, my favorite thing now is one of these people was discredited for cheating like at the thing, and now there's like a big swirling controversy because it's possible one of the other ones has been like faking his scores for like 30 years or something. Um, so I don't know, that maybe actually even makes it more American, I don't know. <laughs> So there's always games for girls, and sometimes really explicitly games for girls. So this is Strawberry Shortcake Musical Matchups. It is very, very cute. Um, it's a game for the Atari 2600. 
And uh, if you're not familiar with, with this game, it, it's a matching game, it has really cute audio, and it's really focused on these strawberry shortcake characters. If you didn't grow up at a, a time when you cared about strawberry shortcake characters, um, this is a, a brand and a set of characters that's come up with by the American Greeting Card Company, uh, which always sounds funny now, but like Rainbow Bright was actually Hallmark. Um, and so both of the major card companies were really engaged in kind of like designing and marketing characters in a way that almost now seems, um, I think you see more in Japan than in the US actually at this point in time. Uh, but anyway, so there's, there's things like this made, they're usually licensed, they're often tied to existing brands. Atari's really big on licensing as we all know, like they wanna make um, games that are tied to popular properties. Um, but even then, like by 1988, we have these two pieces of, of data I think are really interesting. Um, <laughs> oh, excuse me, just to jump back real quick. Also around this time, a couple interesting things. Um, is, is there's tons of information showing that there are women in arcades, but they're underrepresented, right? So you'll see like eight men to three women was one set I saw, right? Um, women made up 27% was another, another one. Um, but there's certain games that are played more by women. Um, and the ones given in the, in the study I looked at were um, Ms. Pac-Man, Centipede, um, Donkey Kong, and Pac-Man. Um, and it's interesting because Ms. Pac-Man was made to appeal to women, but they were already playing Pac-Man, so maybe they didn't, they could have just, you know, stuck with that brand, which I guess worked well. And then Centipede, of course, is very famously uh, one of the few games that Atari, that had a woman on the design team. Uh, so, anyway, in 1988, uh, Playthings, which is one of the, the many uh, trade magazines, reports that uh, women and girls are 21% of players, so the number's actually already gone down by the end of the 80s. And Nintendo, which is often seen as more inclusive and touchy-feely in the US, it's only 27% of players are girls and women. So it's low. Um, and then we get into the 90s and like everything just gets grosser. Um, like the 90s are very aggressive. Um, and so Sega uses this, this slogan for a while, right? Like Genesis does what Nintendo don't, which I always love, like it, it's so salacious. Um, and so they're really advertising as like, we're not family friendly. Except for they back off that, then when like the, the Senate wants to talk to them about violence games, they're like, no, 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 you know. Um, and so there's, there's all these ways they like frame themselves differently depending on who's asking what. Um, but yeah, so the ads just get gross. And here's another example. I have like dozens of examples if you want them, but I'm just gonna show this one. Um, and so this is an ad for Battle Cruise 3000, and it's a woman in lingerie, and, and this is a part of a series. There's three or four of these ads, and you know, it's like, not now, I'm playing this game. And so there's, there's like a lot going on here, right? Like, okay, there's a woman, but she's not really a person. She's just like there for sex. And even the most attractive woman who wants to have sex with you is worth less than a video game, right? Um, and so that's a 1996 ad. And, and this kind of rhetoric's very, very common in this period. Um, but at the same time, you also have hits that do really well, like Echo the Dolphin in 1992, which I would play the video of, but we've been having internet problems and the music's real cute. Um, so Echo the Dolphin's a huge hit, especially with girls, but really with everyone. It's a, a big hit. Um, this game had the most like uniformly positive reviews of any game I could find from the period. Like every review of this um, version of the Aladdin game, because there's two, um, beloved. Like people love this game. And it was also seen as something that did really well um, with girls as players. In 1995, we get Chop Suey, which I love. It's from Magnet Interactive. Um, and it's, it's made to be the most beautiful thing a seven-year-old girl has ever seen. I always love that description of it. And you kind of like stumble around this weird town and your aunt's dr like drinking martinis and like you can explore and you're with your friend and everything's like colorful and wonderful and weird. And David Sedaris narrates it. And it's great. Um, but that's, this happens in 1995. Entertainment Weekly names it CD-ROM of the year. It's, it's a big hit unexpectedly. And Magnet Interactive is primarily like an advertising company. Um, so but they're just trying stuff, right? And then Rachel knows a lot more about this title than I do, but this is a Barbie fashion designer from Mattel, um, also in 95, and it sold something like 500,000 copies, I think, in the first year it was out. Um, so it's, it's just like hugely popular. And I think kind of what these show, it's not that girls weren't wanting to play games, it's that there was like nothing they wanted to play. Um, so these games are, are kind of like barely a blip in the game's press, though. 
So these are critical successes, they're commercial successes, but like there's zero, literally zero coverage I've ever found in a games publication of Barbie fashion designer. And I found two or three total pieces about um, any of the uh, any of the the Magnet Interactive um, Chop Suey and then the the two uh, later games that were made. And they're like this long. They're like maybe three inches or five inches of column space, right? They're kind of glossed over. They're treated as children's things and then dismissed, which doesn't happen to other games in that same way. So they show an audience. They do really well financially. Um, and so you start to see this unstable coalition. And, and again, this is from um, the book from Barbie to Mortal Kombat that is uh, Henry Jenkins and Justine Cassell edited. But it's in their introduction, and they talk about the the problem is you have this unstable coalition. You have people working together that don't always make sense as people that would work together. They don't want the same things, right? So you have uh, game companies, you have activists, you have researchers, and they're all interested in getting girls to play games. But they're interested in it for very different reasons. Game companies want to sell games. Um, that's what they want to do, the end. Girls are on tap market, right? Uh, when I interviewed Brenda Laurel, she talked about one of the people she was trying to get to support the company said, you know, there's, a, there's this multi-billion dollar interest rate with an empty lot next door, right? Game companies want to build on the empty lot. There are many people working in the games industry that are passionate about this because it's something they care about and they want, they want to see change, but that's not the industry as a whole, right? There's still that bottom line. Um, Activists want girls to play games because it's seen as part of helping women be more, be, they're helping increase the number of women in technology jobs. Um, it's an equity issue, et cetera. And there's some evidence that's true that people that interact with computers when they're young are more likely to pursue technical careers. Um, but there's just really little over, overlap overall here. So what ends up happening is they work on these things kind of together, kind of for a while. Um, and you get companies like Her Interactive, which is quite successful. Um, they put out their first titles, uh, McKinsey and Company. And this one's interesting because any time you read a review of it written by a man, they pan it. I found one review written by a woman, and she was delighted. Um, because the game came with a lipstick and she was like, what, this is so cool. Like, I've never gotten a game with something so cool in it before. And, you know, and she wasn't joking. Like, she was, I think, pretty excited about this game. Like, it seemed like the kind of thing that she would have liked when she was that age. Um, and they also licensed the Vampire Diaries, which I, like, I'm still, I, they were ahead of their time, right? Like, that's, like, such a bit, they, this is, like, the CW waiting to happen. Um, and, and, you know, that game does fairly well. But where they really have a hit is, is um, Nancy Drew, Secrets Can Kill. And this is a huge run uh, long-running series based on an interesting, pro like an existing property. And I always like it because at the same time that we think of um, stuff for girls being very pink, like these are so for girls and they're like red and teal and bloody, right? Um, and so it's, it's a really different kind of way. And if you look at games that adult women play, they're often mystery games. They're often kind of games with deduction and puzzles. So like, you know, like women like things like makeup and, you know, murders. <laughs> Um, and you also get Purple Moon, which I can talk about forever, so I'm going to try and talk about it very quickly. Um, this is Brenda Laurel's company that she founds with other folks. It came out of work she did as a researcher. Um, they spent $5 million looking at what girls wanted, how they played, what they played with, what they cared about, how they wanted to spend their time. Um, and they came out with three series, uh, Rocket's New School and Secret Paths start at the same time. Secret Paths is my personal favorite. Um, Starfire Soccer Challenge is later, and only one title comes out, but it was actually the first sports game made for girls, or like with girl players. Like it's really, really different. Um, but one thing I think is important that came out of their research is they found that the second, if it was in a household where there were multiple children, if it was something the children were all supposed to play together, if there was a boy in the house, he dominated it and the girl would not play it. So they wanted something that boys wouldn't touch. They actually talked about giving things cooties. They wanted something that was like unappealing to boys, but that girls would really like. And these games are hits, like people still talk about them. There's women that work in the industry that talk about getting really interested in video games because they played these when they were eight or nine. Um, and we now talk about the tween market all the time, right? So they're kind of at the early curve of that too. So reasons for the decline. Sad. Um, girls like things and software reviewers don't. Um, 
you know, it's one thing to say like, oh, there's games for girls now, but you don't have the infrastructure that exists to support the, the, the other games, right? They're not getting reviewed by the critics. They're not of interest to the existing critics. Um, it's unclear where to sell them. Like there's some shelf space weirdness around these. Like are they toys? Are they games? Are they software? Um, and so they, they don't fit into the existing ecosystem of how things are distributed and sold. Um, some of the games are bad. Right? So I talked about some games that are good, some of the games are bad, but you know what? They release a lot of bad games every year and we haven't been like, you know what? No more first person shooters. Some of them are bad. <laughs> some of them are really bad, right? Um, Mattel tries to buy everything, which everyone always thinks I'm joking about this. I am not. Um, this is the period when they acquire um, American Girl, Right? Um, it's the period when they, they, they actually acquire Purple Moon and then shutter it. Um, they buy many other things. Like, so many, you can probably name more things. They buy many things. Um, and they're actually not interested in sustaining them. They're at, interested in eliminating competition in most cases. They keep and expand American Girl. I could talk about that a lot too. I will not. Um, and then the software market's extremely volatile. So remember I said that, that Chop Suey wins like, you know, CD-ROM of the year from Entertainment Weekly? Like, that's a big deal. Within about nine to 12 months of it coming out, you cannot purchase it. It's just out of distribution. Um, and you also have lots of things like companies that were selling software stop selling software. Um, and it, it just gets real messy. It's hard to keep things in print and available. And there's, there's a lot of volatility. Um, and then also the internet ruins everything. Uh, and I, I say that facetiously, but Purple Moon did an interesting thing where they had an, a website, and they were kind of early to have a website, but the website had like tons of stuff you could do. Like you could write letters to the characters and the characters would write back to you, which apparently for at first was like one lady, <laughs> like one woman was doing this thing. Oh, thank you. Um, and so this, this, this poor woman's like, you know, uh, in charge of writing all these emails back and finally they're like, we gotta stop doing this. This is like all this person can do because she's supposed to be an administrative assistant. She's supposed to be like answering the phones and stuff. Um, but so they did really interesting stuff there in terms of kind of transmedia branding and expanding to new audiences and stuff. But they also um, ran into this problem, which is at this moment in the, in the mid to late 90s, all the investment dollars start going towards internet things. Um, and of course we get like the first dot com bust and stuff a few years in, but Purple Moon was actually selling physical products. Um, and they weren't just making the CD-ROM games, which like maybe could have moved to something web-based. They were making like toys and eventually books and all these things. So it's supposed to be this whole like branded experience you can have. And the investment dollars go away from this and towards um, the internet. So they can't, they lose their funding, right? And, and that happens over and over again with different companies. Um, and it's, it's rough, right? Um, and and it's, again, speaks to problems with that investment model. Like if, you, if you're familiar with the, the, the very nice business bag brand Dagny Dover, um, there's a, there was a great Forbes piece about Dagny Dover trying to get in investors and they make these great bags that are really well thought out for like if you have a job and you need to carry like a nice bag, right? Mm -hmm. And they couldn't get investors, they couldn't get investors, they have tons of experience, they come out of fashion, they come out of business, and they finally started having trunk shows and inviting the investors to watch people shop because all the investors were men and they did not understand that there was a consumer base that cared about bags that much. Like, they didn't get it, right? And why would they? Uh, but that speaks to some infrastructure problems, right? So I think we could do better. Um, like, I really sincerely believe this. And I'm not, I think a lot of people did great things during this period, but I think we could do um, better. So um, to that end, I think we can think about shorter term um, coordinated ways to work together. So we're forming coalitions, not like in general, like, yay, we're excited about Games for Girls, but with specific goals in mind. Right? And not with this aim of like something being like kind of amorphous and ongoing because nothing amorphous is ever ongoing, right? It'll die. Um, we need infrastructure to support and recognize effective diversity and inclusion. We're starting to see some of that. Uh, Lambda has done, a, uh, Lambda Legal does some work with that. Um, GLAD does an amazing job recognizing um, diverse representation, right? So like, there's lots of places like that, and I think there's room to keep doing those kinds of efforts. I think, um, 
you know, people like little pats on the back and trophies and things. And, and I say that facetiously, but I also like these things. They're great. Um, you know, give me a gift card. It's nice. Uh, so there's lots of ways that we can think about making an infrastructure where this kind of work is recognized and is valued and is promoted. Um, lots of children's book awards do this, right? And like, we're not doing this around games in the same way necessarily. Um, and then the other thing is like actually leverage the research on the pipeline problem. One of the problems we really see with diversity and, and uh, women in STEM initiatives is that they talk about like, oh, we gotta get girls interested, we gotta get girls interested. That's not where you're losing people. I mean, you might be a little bit, but like, we're not actually worried about children. We're worried about people that are like adults around 25. Um, because people actually go through and they get their degrees and they're qualified and they start their first job and then they're in a terrible, terrible environment and want to quit. And like, who could blame them? So the pipeline problem isn't that we're not, there's nothing coming in or nothing going through, it's, the, it's leaking because there are massive workforce problems. And we're seeing that in the games industry, I think quite acutely right now. And related to that, my last point is, I think it's really important to support reforms in the industry in terms of, of labor. Um, because a lot of practices that become normalized in the industry like crunch are actually actively hostile to any kind of diversity in your workforce. Um, and, it's never gonna diversify if you're working on a churn of very, very young people with nothing, you know, nothing to hold them back. And that doesn't say, that's not because I don't like young people. They're great. I work with college students who I think are amazing. But if, if you're churning people through and burning them out in three years, it's totally unethical. It's totally unsustainable. And you're never gonna get the kind of um, expertise and growth that you get from experience. Um, and so I think there's a lot of ways that this could be improved just by thinking about the work practice and production practices of the industry. Um, and that's kind of where I want to end that. We can talk more at the end. Um, and thank you to my sponsors, I say not sarcastically. Um, so Illinois Tech, where I work, does a lot to support my research. I also did a lot of this work while I was at the UNCW um, in Wilmington at, as part of their Visiting Scholars Program. Um, also thanks to the Learning Games Initiative Research Archive. If you're interested in doing research, they'll actually mail you stuff, like real stuff to your house that you can mess with. Um, and the Strong Museum of Play, I always use their stuff. Uh, Stanford Libraries and also the Internet Archive. Uh, and I can tell you very funny stories about not being able to use things because of plugins from the mid 90s. Um, the best place to find me almost always is on, on Twitter. I'm Sparkle Bliss there. Um, and I'll usually respond. If I don't, um, you can try again. It's not personal. So uh, thanks so much. I'm excited to talk about this. And I'll hand things over to Rachel. <laughs> So I thought it was interesting, um, your your comments about, or your point about Mattel buying everything, right? If they buy up Purple Moon, um, they buy up all the competition. Um, I wanted to follow up on that because I think another really interesting part of that story is that Mattel, after acquiring all these uh, competing girl game companies, they actually sell Mattel Interactive. <laughs> so not only do they buy everything up, but then um, as a result of some like, they, they had this, um, acquisition of the learning company with Broderbund, and it ended up uh, hemorrhaging a lot of money, and part of what they did was actually sell Mattel Interactive to another company, and it basically went away, and uh, Mattel didn't make CD-ROM games anymore. Uh, so that was kind of like another uh, really, really troubling thing for video game history. Uh, not only is competition gone, but now the now the big boy's out as well. Um, so hello, my name is Rachel Simone Weil. Um, I am the uh, director of Femicom Museum, uh, which has the goal of uh, archiving, collecting, and um, preserving and sharing the history of girls' video games, software, and electronic toys. So I've been doing that since 2012, um, and that's sort of my um, academic background and research. Um, Last year, I actually gave a, a talk on Barbie fashion designer um, and spoke with the um, woman who created the game. If you missed that talk, I, I think it was recorded, but also you can check out on femicom.org. Um, I have a podcast where I've actually interviewed her. Um, it's a really fascinating story. It involves Titanic and things catching on fire and visions that were had in dreams. And it's like, it's, it's an amazing backstory. Um, one of the most successful girl games from the 1990s. Um, in addition to doing that work, I also am a, an 8-bit homebrew game developer. 
Um, so I know some of you, um, as I recognize you in the audience, thank you, were at the um, Astrocade talk earlier uh, this afternoon. So um, I kind of, in, in addition to doing this historical work on girls games, I tried to take that work and then actually create games in the way that they were made in the 80s and 90s. Um, so this is a love horoscope and fortune teller game, uh, love compatibility test for the NES. Um, I had some cartridges for sale. I think they're all sold out. If you're interested, come talk to me afterwards. There might be some more. Um, but this is kind of how I take my historical work and then put it sort of into an arts practice, is sort of reimagining what if um, what if there had been more like girly games for the NES and, and back in the 80s and 90s when we saw that shift happen to be very like sort of extreme with a capital X. Uh, so what I want to talk today uh, about in with respect to girl games is actually um, the history of electronic toys for girls. So um, right around the the 80s, toy companies and toy manufacturers were kind of freaked because video games were massive, uh, just like exploded in the toy market, right? And so this is a picture of a Toys R Us. Um, I guess this would have been around the time it was an Atari 5200 here. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what year this is, but toy stores went from having no video games to having lots and lots of video games and were like, you know, a lot of retail space became dedicated to video games. And so a lot of the toy manufacturers were like, oh my god, how are we going to compete with video games, right? There was this big technological advance. And so we see a lot of uh, traditional toy makers actually shifting and trying to either like compete or coexist with video games um, by moving to, um, ha you know, having more electronic components or, or ICs. So um, in the early days, we have electronic games like Simon. Um, this is a really like a classic canonical electronic game uh, of memory uh, made by Ralph Baer, who also is responsible for the Odyssey. Um, this was Milton Bradley, I think 1978. Um, so there are the games like this that are sort of like digital native, um, but then we see a lot of this kind of thing. This is Electronic Battleship. So they took an existing game, Battleship, and made it electronic, like needlessly made it electronic. Um, and this was this idea of sort of like helping to get these traditional toy makers like Milton Bradley uh, to coexist with video games. And in fact, a lot of traditional toy makers do try to make a foray into video game console market. So Mattel um, had a console, right, the Intellivision. Coleco, which um, Coleco started out, it's Coleco is Connecticut Leather Company. They started as a shoemaker. They went on to make Cabbage Patch dolls, and then eventually the ColecoVision. So you see a lot of like traditional toy makers trying to get in on the video game craze, and um, most of the time their consoles actually weren't particularly successful, and so they went these alternate routes, like um, electronic-ifying existing toys and experiences. Well, what we see that's really interesting is that in the that period of the late 80s to 2000s, we see uh, electronic toys making a really big shift toward things marketed to girls. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about some of those. Um, there were a lot of uh, LCD handheld games like this one. This is Tiger Electronics. Uh, electronic Poly Pocket from 1994. And there were a lot of games in this form factor um, based on girls' IP, uh, things like that. And these were um, LCD handheld games, relatively inexpensive. Um, we also have, this is a trio of classics. Uh, so companies like Tiger and Casio were making um, electronic organizers and diaries, and that's what you see on the left. Um, a lot of these incorporated things like horoscopes, keeping track of your friend's phone numbers. Some of them had um, like IR-based messaging systems, so you could like secret, secretly send messages to a friend who also had a device. Um, this was like clearly before the era of cell phones. Um, some of these also gave dating advice, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, on the far right, we have Pixel Chicks, uh, which is pretty cool. They are like plastic three-dimensional houses that have a, uh, a clear screen in them with an LCD character that moves. And as you put the houses in proximity of one another, the characters can walk from one house to the other. And so they have these really interesting interactions. Um, and this is like a super, super fascinating technology in this. And of course, in the middle, um, Tamagotchi, not just for girls, but of course, was very popular with girls. 
Uh, we also see the incorporation of traditional toys uh, that come packaged with either software or um, some kind of electronic or computer component. So this is uh, Talk With Me Barbie. I think this was 1997. And um, so this is, I'm not sure if you can tell based on the size of this, but it's, it's a quite a large box. It has a full-size Barbie doll uh, right in the center. And behind her, um, if you open up this flap, you will see a computer playset. And uh, this particular playset also comes with a CD-ROM and a uh, cord that has a serial port connection. So you can connect your PC and you can make Barbie say certain pre-programmed phrases. You can like teach her how to say your name and things like that. Again, they're all pre-recorded. Um, but this is kind of a, an example of taking the, those traditional modes of play and mixing them with like sort of electronic and software um, components. Um, we also, as we move later into like the 2000s, we get things like Diva Stars. And so this was again a, a doll line um, made by Mattel. And the idea here was to combine like traditional forms of doll play with uh, like web-based experiences. Um, does anyone here remember Diva Stars? Yeah, quite a few hands. That's awesome. Uh, finally, we have a really big swath of electronic <coughs> board games. And electronic board games, and uh, in, in board games in particular, um, we see a lot of things shifting to like board games for girls in this time period. Um, this is Ask Xandar, which is sort of like based on the Zoltar. You know, it's um, an electronic uh, crystal ball that just says things like yes or no, sort of like an eight ball, um, but it but it's, it talks. Um, there are actually a lot of these. I, I probably don't have time to go into all of them, but I wanted to mention a few. Electronic Mall Madness, uh, a game where you swipe your credit card uh, into a little electronic reader and try to buy things from different parts of the mall. Um, electronic Dream Phone, which is basically Guess Who, but with cute boys. Um, Girl Talk Dateline, which is basically the same thing. Um, That's So Raven Girl Talk, which is actually really similar to Ask Xandar. There's a, a sort of crystal ball thing that you can wave your hand over. Um, and one of my favorites is Party Mania, which is a VCR game. So um, the idea here is that there's a, a board game component and also a, a VHS tape that you put into your um, VHS player and it gives you certain prompts. And ostensibly the game is about going to a party with a really cute boy, um, but the way that you are able to go to the party is you have to do chores. And so actually the whole game is about doing chores. <laughs> It's like, it's like real life. Yeah. It's like you roll a five and it's like, oh, now you have to like sweep your bedroom or whatever. It's like the game actually sounds like maybe kind of not, not so fun. Um, but it's, it's kind of an interesting approach where, um, again, traditional toy makers and board game makers were looking at ways to incorporate electronic technology. And in particular, they were targeting a lot of this work toward girls. And I think Carly talked a lot about some of the reasons for this, right? Like that the idea of the empty lot next door. A lot of toy makers were saying, oh my gosh, there's so many video games out there. How are we gonna compete? How are we gonna coexist? And they see this market that's untapped. And so they really steer a lot of these electronic toys and board games toward, you know, sort of marketing to girls. Um, I think there are some, some other interesting reasons for the shift as well. Um, not only is it filling an existing gap that console gaming leaves, um, they were generally a less risky purchase than console games. So keep in mind that, in especially in the 80s and 90s, when games are primarily on cartridge, they're quite expensive. And then you also have to have the console. Now, if you were like me, I was an only child. Um, no one was gonna buy me a Nintendo console so I could play the one girl game that came out for it, right? Because it's like, you know, a couple hundred dollars for the console and 50 bucks for the game. Um, it's not really a good value. Now, if, maybe if I already had an NES or a game console at home, that would be something different. Um, but this is quite expensive if you're not really invested in the whole library or, or can't, don't want to take advantage of the whole library. Um, so things like LCD handheld games gave a sort of feeling of a video game. Um, but they were a lot more affordable. And um, I think also when we think about like how games are marketed, we're not only thinking about the person that's going to be playing it, but the person that's going to be purchasing it for a child. And so traditional IP, like brand names that you're familiar with, if it has Barbie on it and your kid likes Barbie, like it's probably gonna be fine. Um, this was also seen as less risky, whereas video games, it was really 
sort of an unknown, like if they didn't have an associated IP or character that the, the child knew, then it might be more of a risky purchase. Um, and so it, what's interesting to me, and this happens over and over, this is actually a pattern in gaming history, is that like, you know, uh, I, Carly, as you're saying, like a lot of folks do a lot of research to find out like how do girls play and like what do they like and what do they want? And uh, that's kind of cool. Like at least it wasn't just a bunch of people going like, I don't know, make it pink and put a butterfly on it. <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate that they did this research, but often what their research led them to was things that wasn't like specifically what we would consider a video game today, right? Like maybe it didn't use a video screen or maybe, you know, it was productivity software or, some other, you know, an LCD handheld game. And because these games sort of diverged from mainstream console gaming, they actually become really co difficult to coalesce under the banner of gaming history. And this is something I talked about last year and something I continue to experience when I'm trying to, in part of my preservation work, let's say I get a stack of Barbie CD-ROM games and I wanna go put them in an internet database that, um, you know, that, that, that folks can contribute to. And I put in all my Barbie CD-ROM games in the database and submit them, and an admin comes back to me and says, well, these aren't really games. Um, because there's not like a score, and you can't like win or die. And so it's interesting to me that the very things that people design to help them appeal to girls are the things that now make them difficult to historicize and actually like make part of the canon. Um, if you think about LCD handheld games, um, they're very difficult to, well, I guess pretty much impossible to emulate. Um, you have to simulate them. Um, a lot of these things are difficult to preserve. A board game isn't, electronic board game isn't really something you can pop into an emulator the way you can an NES game. Um, so it's interesting to me that these things, whether they were intentionally designed that way or not, um, we just find that they're difficult to, to kind of coalesce under gaming history. And, uh, you know, I think you could make the counter argument of like, well, just it's t toy historian's problem to, to figure out. Um, or like, you know, yeah, maybe give it to the board game historians because the video game historians don't really want it. Um, but there's something about gaming history and video games in particular um, that I think attracts a lot of historical interest in the way that video games are sometimes analyzed more in, in the way of, in the vein of uh, film or literature. And board games and toys do not get that treatment. And so by excising girls' uh, toys and software from uh, video games, you actually lose a lot of this like really interesting critical space. Um, so I think that that's something, at least in my research, um, I try to advocate for saying like, hey, I know this isn't maybe like a traditional video game, but I think we need to think about it in the context of video gaming. Um, I think those things fit together. Um, so I wanna kinda come back to some of these questions of like, what are girl games? Why weren't there any girl games back in the day? Uh, isn't girl games this, this idea? Aren't you just like re reinforcing the gender binary and, um, and stuff like this? So, I think like this idea of like why weren't there any girl games back in the day, I think both of us have talked about the fact that like, well there were, but we're really bad at capturing the history of them. Um, whether it's because folks weren't writing software reviews about them, or um, because they're not considered true video games, or there's, there's like a, a host of reasons um, that we're not actually capturing this stuff. Um, and so this question about like are there girl games, I've done a lot of uh, sort of research of literature and every like 10 years or so there's an article that's like girl games are the new thing they've never existed before but like now they you, i mean you see it in the 80s you see it in the 90s you see it in the 2000s you see it in the 2010s um i guess we're going to see it in this decade as well um it's the same story over and over again it's like no one did like did y'all not google this like did y'all not look it up because there's been girl games um we're just like not super great at coalescing it into our history. Um, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that. Yeah, and I, I also think like some of it's, it's, it's hard to sustain the companies, right? Like it's really easy to be like, oh, we have many building toys, right? And you can name the building toy companies and some of them date back to like the 1880s um, or were founded by the sons of famous architects or like whatever, right? The companies that make games for girls tend to like exist and then not exist. Um, and, I, and I think the reasons for that aren't that these games aren't successful. Some of the games are extremely successful, but 
but especially over the past like 20, 30 years, it has to do with a production and business environment where you're dependent on investors. And if you're dependent on investors, you're dependent on people that already made a bunch of money, usually in tech. And who made a bunch of money in tech? Like, generally people that have not been girls ever, right? And, and that doesn't, that means like when they're looking at things to invest in, they're like, oh, you know what's a sexy investment? This thing for nine-year-olds. That, that's not what's happening, right? And, and so you get like hugely valued companies that do things of bizarre and dubious value, and then you get companies that can't get enough money to keep the lights on that are doing really innovative design work. Yeah, and I think too, like when I think about things like, <laughs> you know, Mega Man franchise, Mario franchise, like those rely on Capcom and Nintendo still being around, right? Like you can go into a Target and buy a shirt with like Super Mario pixelated on it. Um, th those companies are still around and they have a vested interest in keeping their properties alive. The, if these companies aren't around, they're not like writing their own history in the form of like reselling it to us on t-shirts, mm -hmm. um, which I, I think is actually a like a bigger part of video game history than we really like care to admit. Um, a lot of a lot of our like nostalgia and um, our sense of love for old games is really fueled by like, I got this Pac-Man coffee cup, and it becomes part of your identity. And if these companies don't exist to like profit off of their own brands, then that kind of thing doesn't exist. I remember being like really really surprised when I went into like a Hot Topic or something. Many, I don't, is this Hot Topic still a thing? Yeah, it it's, totally is. Okay. I buy clothes there. Oh, cool. Um, I went into a Hot Topic and saw retro My Little Pony and retro Gem and the Holograms shirts, and I was completely floored. Um, and this was like 15, 20 years ago. But it was like, oh, like, yeah, I have memories too. Like, <laughs> sell me things on a t-shirt too. Um, not that I'm like super pro, like, you got to buy stuff. Um, but there was like a clear gap where a lot of the retro stuff, it was like Transformers and Ninja Turtles and these like brands and IPs that were more, tended to be more marketed to boys. Um, the concept of girl games reinforcing the gender binary or like why do you have to call out girl games? Why can't you just like put them in games history? Um, and I think that's a good question. Um, you know, I'm really not like a gender conformist. I don't think that girls have to play with pink things or that boys can't play with them. And I also recognize that we need a lot more space for like um, non-binary folks and people all along the gender spectrum and that like girl games and boy games kind of feels like it's going against that. And so I think that's something I continue to like struggle with the language and terminology um, where I, I do want to be inclusive and don't want to be prescriptive about what I think a girl game is. Um, on the other hand, I see games that are pink and about makeup and fashion are being completely obliterated from the historical record. Like those games specifically that were marketed to girls, whether or not like girls play with them. Um, I see these games like just the, the palimpsest is just being completely erased. Um, I think we've already lost a lot of that history. And I think a lot of people that were involved in creating those games have already like scattered to the wind. And so for me, like I'm not, so, it's not for, so much about preserving like oh, girl games, like, I don't, I don't care. Like, if you don't like pink or you love pink or whatever, it's fine. Um, but I see these games specifically, like, being, um, they're, they're not present in the canon, and so I want to particularly target those. Right, and kind of, like, regardless of, of quality, and I, I, again, I think some of them are very good, but, like, regardless of quality, um, they're part of our historical and cultural record, and they should be part of that record. They should be part of what's preserved, because otherwise you end up with these, like, really bizarre loops, right? Where it's like, oh, we're re reinventing like games for girls over and over again. Look, it's a tiny doll in a house. Oh my gosh, there are so many tiny dolls in houses, right? <laughs> like, um, and, and like, those are all great, but it, it's, it's, I think speaks to a lot of problems. And there are ways that this reinforces the binary that I think can be problematic, but at the same time, like, that's still a huge part of how toys are marketed. Toys have actually gotten more gendered rather than less, less gendered in the past 50 years. Um, and it's interesting that as toys have gotten more gendered, we actually just have less stuff for girls, yeah. right? Um, and when you make things, there's a, a really great article um, where somebody did a study of, of production practices at game studios in Australia, and they asked people how they design, and, and most people don't do design research. Purple Moon was really anomalous for doing that much design research. Um, most people go like, 
I don't know. I'm just going to make a game. It's going to be a good game. I know what's good because I like games. And then they make like the game that they imagine is a good game. And that means they're only making games for people like themselves. Because in fact, like none of us are like the person, right? Like none of us are like the prototypical person that plays games. We're all like idiosyncratic in our own ways, whether that's your gender identity or your age or like my hands really bother are bothering me today. So I'm thinking about kind of like, I can't do things with tons of fast button pushing because it hurts, um, right? Like there's all kinds of ways that like how I interact with games is shaped. Um, and if I make something for everyone, that's impossible. And I end up making things for me. And if the industry, especially like in, in 2010, the industry was 11% women, so the industry is 89% men and everyone's making games for people like themselves, who are the games for, right? And, and so this is where I think it's important to think about the composition of the industry and some of these things are artifacts of that. Like part of why you get so many games for girls in the 90s is you have women that have been working in the industry since the 80s who are now in decision making roles and can actually exert some influence and have some clout. Yeah, I think another thing we don't talk about is like, the, I think uh, w uh, one thing that kind of underpins all of this is this, this comment about I'm a girl and I hate pink stuff, um, which is sort of like a, just an example, but I think all of us tend to feel pretty uncomfortable about gender stereotypes, especially about um, stereotypes of women, because we see that they're harmful and we want to dismantle them, and I totally get that. Um, but then you get in this issue where we only throw out the girly stuff, and we're not talking about like the other games that were marketed to boys. We don't we don't say like, well, I don't I don't know if Mega Man is sending a good message to our young boys about how to be a a person like what you know there's a lot of like concern what is the moral value yeah of there's a lot of like concern like well is barbie really good for our girls because she's just teaching them about makeup and that's like really harmful meanwhile we're not like is mega man bad for boys because it teaches you to shoot everything which is like also a cromulent question but yeah. we don't we don't couch it in those terms of like is it like stereotypes for boys and and we don't throw that stuff away we're not like oh mega man's about shooting that's bad so let's like not historicize it and let's just like throw it away and pretend it didn't happen so when we selectively do that only to the girl games then we're missing the picture we're throwing out our history without even like having an opportunity to review it and where i think it's really critical and what i'm really excited about is like i see a ton of Countercultural readings, queer readings of girl games, um, you know, like opportunities to reimagine and reinvent. And I think there are so many um, like trans game developers, queer game developers who are really leading the charge in remixing and reimagining um, and reclaiming femininity and gender stuff and like taking that and sort of like, I, I don't know, I really love their perspective as both like fans and creators. Um, Kind of reimagining and rereading this this canon, and we uh, like we need we need to preserve those materials so that kind of work can continue to happen. Yeah, and I think especially like with this idea of like oh I hate pink stuff. I think it's so dangerous. Like we have to be careful that like we're not not just throwing out the girly stuff and also not just like taking our own experiences of trying to survive like acute misogyny all the time and like becoming part of that system right like do you really hate pink stuff or do you just hate the patriarchy <laughs> questions but <laughs> yeah what's up yeah so what about the games that were they may have been primarily geared to boys but they went an extra step to try and make stuff in there for girls like when I was growing up, one of my favorite things was Final Fantasy Three, the thing they gave to sit. And I didn't even care for all the stories of the boys being lost. I loved playing, going through the stories of the girls, particularly Kara, who, who if you paid attention to her story, she was she had a, she had a lot of growth from being a slave to becoming a person, growing, falling in love adopting children and having to learn to be a mother, but also having her fears and insecurities mm -hmm. storyline of so much emotion hidden within this game that was mostly marketed to boys. Yeah. So I, I'm going to make one comment, and then I don't know if you have something to say, but I think 
both of us have primarily been talking about video game marketing in the US and American game. Well, we talked a little bit about some Japanese games, but I think um, one thing that I learned in the course of my history is that like um, the the idea of like a female playable character, um, there's, there's quite a few differences in um, Japanese games and American games. And I think when I, I did some research in my graduate work in Tokyo, and I had this idea of like, oh, there are all these Sailor Moon games, there are all these Hello Kitty games that only came out in Japan. There must be like arcades full of women playing these games. And I, I had a very rude awakening when I went to check out the Sailor Moon arcade games and it was all men playing them. Um, I, I think that in the US in particular, we have a very, we map very one to one, like, if you're a if you're a woman, you want to play as a female character, and if you're a dude, you want to play as a guy character. And you ne like a boy d could not play a girl character. I mean, like I'm exaggerating, but I think we have more of a one-to-one -one mapping. Whereas I feel like in Japan, that is less so, or it, it's I think harder to take. I'm always cautious of sort of taking my Western perspective and just assuming that it applies to Japanese games, mm -hmm. where I think there's just so many complex. And I'm certainly not an expert in like Japanese you know, like gender politics and all of the, the history there. But I, I think like there is some significant difference. difference yeah. yeah. Hopefully that answered your question a little bit. <laughs> So I think I think one thing to be careful with there is Star Wars at its initial um, like the first few rounds of Star Wars like Star Wars was like really heavily about its cute animals and its marketing in the 70s and 80s in a way that I think we forget um, and so like I, as a tiny child, was apparently obsessed with C-3PO, but couldn't say it, which my dad found adorable and likes to tell me about. But, like, I also, like, I had so much Ewok stuff, because I was like, oh my god, they're like cute space creatures, and they're on TV, this is amazing. And and so I think there's ways that girls were consuming that gets left out, because it's actually the, like, now that's, like, seen, like, if I'm like, you know what I really like for Star Wars? The Ewok special. Like, people are horrified. But you know what's awesome? Ewoks, right? And like, so it, it's like this way that the thing gets like cleaned up and like grown up, and that means like more violent and less feminine over time, right? And so yeah, I think I think some of what's happening there is almost cyclical. Like it's they're almost like, oh wait, wait a minute, like Leia was really cool, <laughs> like you know. Um, so I think some of it's that. I do think there's weird stuff like on Paw Patrol where they just like added another girl dog because there was only one girl and now there are two girls. There's still five boys and two girls. <laughs> yeah. um, well, you mentioned a lot about how things have shifted over time with the internet. And a big thing that's come out of it in particular is how a lot of internet free games are gender forbidden. Um, and how does that, I just want to figure out how that relates to like the timeline and all of that. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing, so there was a question about like uh, free-to-play games and a lot of those being like really heavily gendered. Um, I th my, my sense is that a lot, a lot of what those games rely on is like being able to identify with and want to buy a game based on the screenshot. And so I think where they can like really poke at a certain aesthetic or like a certain, like they can drive in at a certain certain market, they will. And I think a lot of those tend to be for girls. Again, uh, 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 yeah, or like based on franchises. Um, There's also a lot of those games, I mean, they're functionally puzzle games, right? Like all the like Connect 3 games and like pattern games and things. And um, those, Puzzle games historically are hugely popular with women. So if you look at the games that like Sierra Online did, especially like uh, the Gabriel Knight series, right, is like very, very um, popular with with adult women, right? And and you start seeing hidden object games are also highly popular with women, um, and also often about mysteries. Um, and and like mystery is actually as as a readership is a genre that that is heavily read by women, right? And so I think a lot of people are also like genre players. It's like you know what I like. Candy Crush, you know what else I like? Things that are like Candy Crush, right? And I think a lot of people actually play games in that manner. Um, I think 
it's interesting that those games remain kind of marginalized in our discussion of games because they're played at like a huge volume by a huge number of people and they actually make more money than anything else at this point. Uh, women spend more on games than men do in general, um, but especially when you start looking at, at uh, freemium games. Yep. I think also you get into that, um, that camp of like not having to invest in a console and you know, like, like for me personally, like, okay, if I'm really interested in very girly, cute games, should I buy an Xbox? Like, maybe not, right? Um, and so I think there's also some, some uh, kind of economic reason for that as well. Absolutely. And yeah, in the back. Hmm. I would like, when I look at lists of the most powerful people in the industry, that all the people look very different from each other. Um, I think for me, uh, I'm really excited to see, and I, I see this starting to happen. Um, one reason I talk about things like electronic board games, like I, I really love every time I give a talk to elicit that feeling of, oh, I haven't thought about that in years. You know, like electronic mall madness. Oh, I had that when I was a kid. I haven't thought about that in years. I think we're really bad at talking about the history of girls games and a lot of women, and I'll, I'll say this for myself as well, like I went through this um, phase where I thought I had to eschew femininity and it was like made me less taken, taken less seriously and I had to be like sort of a tomboy to be seen as intelligent. And so like I have a complicated relationship with my childhood and admitting like yeah i played i played with barbies all the time i played with my little pony all the time and like every everyone's experience is different right um but i think like what i'm really excited about seeing is um game developers starting to look back at those kinds of games and board games electronic handheld games and using those as inspiration because i think for me like as an nes developer it makes me so sad when people spend the time to learn 6502 assembly, l like take all the time it, it takes to learn how to make cartridges and do all this really great retro development and they make another Mega Man game. Like to me that is such a waste when you have the power to rewrite history and you have all these diverse um, like materials to pull from. When I released Electronic Suite and Fun Fortune Teller, it was very clear to me what my, my references were, right? They were like games like MASH. They were the fortune teller thing that you do like this. It was at lovecalculator.com. It was um, horoscope magazines that I read when I was a kid. Like, it was so clear to me what, what the reference material was. And when video game reviewers saw this game, they were like, oh my God, what is this? I don't get it. This is so dumb. And it was like, they just didn't get the reference, right? Like they didn't, they didn't have the, the, pr the prerequisite knowledge to really like understand what I was making references to. So now I see game developers who are hearkening back to those things. And one thing that I'm most proud of with Femicom is that I can preserve these items so that up and coming young folks, game developers, can use that as reference material and go like, oh yeah, sick, I forgot about this like, Beauty and the Beast handheld, I played it all the time when I was a kid. I'm gonna use that as like an aesthetic reference or I'm gonna use that as sort of like a, a color reference, things like that. So that's what I'm excited about. As an aside, they issued two different Beauty and the Beast games. Uh, one was like Belle's Adventure and the other was about the Beast and they were marketed to boys and girls separately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was also an MGA ripoff yeah. of Beauty and the Beast. That was a good one. Good times. Good times. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have a question? Yeah. Um, so the, the success of a lot of the stuff you're talking about was obviously based on retail shelf space, right? Like the Barbie fashion designer would not sell the billions that it sold. It wasn't, you know, in the toy aisle or whatever at Walmart. Um, I'm wondering now that we don't really have retail shelf space so much anymore for video games, I think we're all still, is it like, yeah, you the shelf space, we can do whatever we want, or is it, oh God, no, we're like actually in these closed video games. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think the discovery factor was huge for, for Barbie fashion designer and some of that, like, uh, uh, Mattel also did a Barbie branded digital camera. And they fought really hard to have it moved out of the, the girl toy aisle and into the software aisle. Um, they, 
they saw, for example, that um, the parents of young girls would not walk with their children through the soft or through the software aisle or through the hardware aisle. Um, they would just take them straight to the you know pretty in pink aisle. Um, and so I think that definitely played a big factor in discoverability. Now with the advent of um, you know electronic storefronts and things like that, like I think that discoverability may be hindered a bit. But I don't know that I have like a specific. I think I think research. one of the problems in terms of ecosystem and th something I'd really like to see is I think it's hard right now because I I don't see current publications taking the equivalent of these games seriously still. Um, and so they're undercovered. And actually, if you want to read about them, they're much more likely to show up in like the toy trade. Like the, the publications that cover toys will talk about these. But like, I'm not reading about these on the places I read about video games. And I, and I think that's really, really too bad. Right, I, and I think that that's a huge hurdle to kind of thinking about a more inclusive industry and, and really just like helping people find their way in. Like I'd love to pick up a, a copy of like, I don't even remember what magazine, like I would love Teen Vogue to be covering video yeah. games. Right? I think, yeah, actually that, that reminds me like, I, I, I've looked a lot at IGN reviews of girl games and IGN, I, I don't know if it was purchased by a men's interest magazine or something, but like if you look at IGN's about page, they are a men's interest website. And so they are review sometimes they do have reviews of Barbie games, but they are like comedy pieces, right? Like, ha ha ha, I played Barbie and like you won't believe what happened. Girls like, like things, <laughs> such fools. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, like, and they'll go on and on about how the, oh, Barbie IP is just brainwashing our young women, and then they'll do a review of the new Star Wars game and how, like, iconic it is and, you know, what, ironic. Um, so, so, yeah, I think that's another issue, too, is that when we look at our, our outlets that are covering these games, if they are men's interest sites, and that's, like, Im important in the sense that that's how they sell advertising, right? Like, you go to IGN and you'll see advertisements for, I don't know, men's deodorant, Axe, body spray, or whatever, you know, like, that's the way that they sell advertising, and so they have to keep their content in line with that to mm -hmm. keep, you know, keep the money coming in the door. Yeah. I need to do, I, I picked a random number. Is Julia S. that signed 72 still here? Julia S., okay. Uh, then Lu, Lu, Lucius, maybe? K? Uh, Yay, yeah. you win. <laughs> um, so I know we're out of time. I'm on Twitter as Sparkle Bliss. I'm easy to find there. I'm also, that's my website. Um, I also do a zine called Save Point if you want to like, um, and it's the electronic of it's going to go up in about a week and it's the electronic version's free. Um, and Rachel has her website and is on Twitter. So like we're super findable. Yeah, Party Time Hexcellent is my Twitter and Femicom.org if you want to check out Femicom. Um, look at pictures of old video games and software and toys gone by. Um, I would love to hear any of your stories you have as well about playing these games. So thank you so much yeah, for coming out to the all. panel. I really appreciate it.